Last week, we were looking at waiting on the Lord, not just for one day, but for days. Amen. We looked at the example of the apostles in Acts chapter 2 and in Acts chapter 1. The Lord Jesus told them that they should wait for the promise. And when Jesus ascended, the Bible says that the apostles went back and stayed in the upper room. Now we got to know that between the ascension and the day of Pentecost is 10 days, which means that the disciples locked themselves up in the upper room for 10 days waiting for the promise. Amen. And when we read the scripture, the Bible says that when the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. What it means is that they waited. There was none who was at the who had left the place and wandering about in 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 the city center or uh, at the market or somewhere. The Bible says that they were all together in one place. So they waited on the Lord for ten days. Ten days they were indoors. Hallelujah. And that is a challenge for all of us. Can we lock ourselves away for 10 days and stay in the presence of the Lord without going anywhere? Can we go somewhere for 10 days and just be on the waiting um, on the promise of the Lord? The second example was the example of um, Moses. In Exodus chapter 34. And we saw that the Lord told Moses that when you come in, don't bring anyone with you. Only you. Don't even allow animals to graze at the foot of the mountain. It should be only you. That means that there are times the Lord needs just us. And he needs our attention. Amen. And we need to give him that attention. So the Lord said, just you. Don't bring anyone with you. I don't think even on this occasion, Moses uh, took um, Joshua with him. Because he would normally be on the mountains with Joshua. But this time around, there was no Joshua. It was only Moses and God. Not even animals were allowed to graze near the mountains. And we need to create that quality time with the Lord, just being with the Lord, without anyone interfering. Hallelujah. Amen. 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 Now, today we look at waiting on the Lord for a number of years and we look at about two examples in the bible but there are more examples that we can find in the bible so today's title is waiting patiently in prayer amen Amen. and we'll look at two people who waited on the lord for years before they received the the promise Now, before I begin, I want to give you this illustration. Now, if you plant a seed, whether it's an apple seed, whether it's a a tomato seed, whether it's corn, if you plant that seed, that seed, the day you put it in the soil, goes through a process. You have to wait for that seed to germinate and then to start springing up and then for it to mature into a tree or a plant, for it to start giving out, you know, gradually manufacturing its fruits. 
So before you eat of the fruit of that seed, there is a waiting time. Do you get it? You don't just plant a seed today and just today you start taking of the fruit of the seed. It doesn't work that way. Anytime you plant a seed, there is a waiting time. Because that seed is going to take time to germinate. It's going to take time to grow. And depending on the type of seed that you, you sowed, I think for corn, within uh, three months, if you wait for three months, you should be enjoying from the, the corn, the fruit of the corn. Yeah? Maybe for other plants or for other products, you may have to wait for one year to, for it to give fruit for you to take of the fruit. Amen? Yes. Uh, plants like cocoa maybe to take about six months. Yeah. Or maybe more. I don't know. Cocoa maybe more one year or so for you to get the, the fruit. So this is what we need to you know, settle on as our base and know that when we are working with God and the Lord plants seeds in our lives, it will take a while for those seeds to germinate, to grow, to bear fruit before you can start enjoying of the fruit. Some seeds will give you fruit in three months. Some seed will give you fruit in one year, some seeds will give you fruit in two years. Depending on the type of seed, the type of mission, the type of purpose that God has for your life. So for some of us, the waiting time is longer than others. It depends on what God has planted in your life. Hallelujah. Amen. So if someone's waiting time matures and it gives fruit, wait for yours. Amen? Amen? Definitely, the seed that the Lord has sown in your life will also mature and grow. And your time of eating your fruit will be different from the other person's time of eating of the fruit of the seed. Amen. Now, let's look at our first example. So we'll go to Galatians chapter 1 and the verse 11 to verse 20. Galatians chapter 1 and the verse 11. The first example is the Apostle Paul when the Lord called him. Galatians chapter 1, verse 11 to 20. I want you to know, brothers and sisters, that the gospel I preach is not of human origin. I did not receive it from any man, nor was I taught it. Rather, I received it by revelation from Jesus Christ. For you have heard of my previous way of life in Judaism, how intensely I persecuted the church of God and tried to destroy it. I was advancing in Judaism beyond many of my own age among my people and was extremely zealous for the traditions of my fathers. But when God, who set me apart from my mother's womb and called me by his grace, was pleased to reveal his son to me, so that I might preach him among the Gentiles. My immediate response was not to consult any human being. I did not go up to Jerusalem to see those who were apostles before me, before I was, but I went into Arabia. Later, I returned to Damascus. 
Then after three years, I went up to Jerusalem to get acquainted with Cephas and stayed with him 15 days. I saw none of the other apostles, only James, the Lord's brother. I assure you before God that what I'm writing to you is no lie. Hallelujah. So Paul says that when the Lord called him, the Lord who saw it fit to set him apart in his mother's womb called him by his grace to reveal his son to him. Paul says he consulted no man. So here, Paul lets us realize that his mission was different. And he even said that the message that he preaches, that message of grace was not taught him by any man but the Lord Jesus himself. Amen? Amen. Because he had a different mission. So what did he do? Because his mission was different. He says that when he received the calling, he did not go to Jerusalem to see those who were apostles before him. He went straight to Arabia. That was where Paul waited on the Lord to receive the teachings on the grace of God for the Gentiles. Amen? Then he said, I went, I returned to Damascus. Then he says something. He says, it was only after three years that I went to Jerusalem to see Peter and I was with him for 15 days and after that, I saw James, the brother of Jesus, and that was it. So it wasn't Peter that taught Paul the gospel of grace that have reached out to the Gentiles. Neither was it James, the brother of Jesus, that taught Paul on grace that have reached out to the Gentiles. But he waited on the Lord for three years to get revelation and understanding of the grace of God for the Gentile people. Three years. He was developing his message. It takes time. The, the gestation period takes time. It takes time for you to develop a revelation, a seed. A vision that God has placed in your spirit. Don't rush ahead. Three years to develop the message of grace. The grace of God to the Gentiles. Those who did not have the law. Those who were not considered as descendants of Abraham. Because it was, it was a different message from the norm. Those who have been engrafted into the kingdom of God through his grace and by his grace. That message was going to face a lot of rejection and opposition from those Jewish people who had become Christians and who were preaching that they should still keep the law of Moses. And because the opposition was great, the time to develop that message and get the nitty gritties of those messages that were coming out needed to take time. Hallelujah. Your mission may be different. So it may face a lot of opposition. But you've got, to, you've got to take time to develop yourself by waiting on the Lord and praying until such a time that God tells you, it's now time, now you can go and see Peter. Now you can go and see um, James, the Lord's brother. You see, the Lord knew that Peter was there. But he did not instruct Paul to go and sit under the feet of Peter. 
And the Lord knew that his brother James was there, but he did not instruct Paul to go and sit under the feet of James. He took him to Arabia. Go sit there. I will teach you myself this mission. Hallelujah. Amen. What is your mission? What is your individual designed mission for you? What is your destiny? You see, regarding our destiny, we need to take time to wait on the Lord. Regarding God's purpose for your life, you need to take time to do what? To wait on the Lord. Because if we make a mistake regarding our personal plan, it may take us a while to come back you know, to that main road that we are supposed to chart. Don't forget the enemy has also got his plans to distract you and get you off course. So you need time to what? To focus and wait. And those that take time to wait to fulfill their purpose and destiny, the impact of their purpose and life and destiny becomes generational. Yeah? If your waiting time is longer, the impact of your mission is generational. It's not seasonal. It's not for a time. It's generational. Hallelujah. And because it's going to affect generations, that is why you need to take time to develop that mission and that vision. Let's look at the second person. The second person we're going to look at is Abraham. And then we'll enter into a time of prayer. So Abraham, we go to Genesis chapter 12. So let's go to Genesis chapter 12. The, the story of Abraham is very popular to most of us. Now in Genesis chapter 12, I'll be reading verse 1 to 4. Then I'll jump to Genesis chapter 16 read verse 1 to 4, and then we'll go to Genesis chapter 17. Genesis chapter 12, verse 1 to 4. The Lord said to Abraham, go to your country, your people, and your father's household to the land. Sorry, go from your country, your people, and your father's household to the land I'll show you. Verse 2. I will make you into a great nation, and I will bless you. I will make your name great, and you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and whoever curses you, I will curse. And all peoples of the earth will be blessed through you. So Abraham went, as the Lord had told him, and Lot went with him. Abraham was 75 years old when he set out from Haran. So he was 75 years old. At 75 years old, he received the promise. What was the promise? You will be a great nation. And God was speaking to a man who did not have a son or a daughter. Are you hearing me? Was God speaking into an empty situation? No. God says, you'll be a great nation. So you see, when, when you encounter the presence of God, God speaks your future to you. God speaks your end to you. Are you getting me? Your end you will see but the process, you hardly see it. So God speaks your end to you. So that you keep looking at the end, not at the process. Are you getting it? 
God says you'll be great. That is his word. He speaks the end. Because he is the beginning and the end. So he wants you to focus on the end, not on the process. Focusing on the process can be very discouraging. Focusing on the process can be painful. Focusing on the process can be tiring. Focusing on the process can be repelling. And even at a point, you want to give up. But God speaks your future into your life. And he tells you, focus on the end. You'll be great. Hallelujah. Amen. Now, let's see. So, God blesses Abraham and then he takes the step. Let's go to chapter 16 and the verse 1 to 4. Now, Sarai, Abraham's, um, Abraham's wife, had borne him no children. But when he had... But she had an Egyptian slave named Hagar. So she said to Abraham, The Lord has kept me from having children. Go, sleep with my slave. Perhaps I can build a family through her. Abraham agreed to what Sarai said. So after Abraham had been living in Canaan for 10 years, Sarai, his wife, took her Egyptian slave Hagar and gave her to her husband to be his wife. He slept with Hagar and she conceived. When she knew that she was pregnant, she began to despise her mistress. Okay, so Abraham is 75. God speaks to him, you are a great nation. In chapter 16, after 10 years, after what? After 10 years. The man who was going to be great and be a great nation was still childless after 10 years. So that means Abraham was 85 years. So when he was 85 years, his wife suggested, you know what? I don't think this thing will work. Take my slave. Maybe I'll be able to build a family through um, the, the child that my, my slave will have. Is, is this, does this sound familiar to you? Is this something that is common to you? That you wait for the promise and at certain points, you decide to use other methods, your own way. Some believers have left the house of God and they have consulted dwarfs. They have consulted fetched priests. They have consulted demons to solve that issue for them because it's been 10 years They've been waiting. So, um, Hagar gives them a son. Now, let's go to chapter 17. So, chapter 17, I'll be reading from verse 1 to 5. When Abraham was 99 years old, the Lord appeared to him and said, I am God Almighty. Walk before me faithfully and be blameless. Then I will make my covenant between me and you and will greatly increase your numbers. Abraham fell face down and God said to him, As for me, this is my covenant with you. You will be the father of many nations. No longer will you be called Abraham. Your name will be Abraham. For I have made you a father of many nations. Interesting. Now, you see, God, 
they had a son, Ishmael. God didn't say anything. I said God did not what? Now the Bible says that when Abraham was 99 years old, it means that God was quiet for 14 years. After the birth of Ishmael. After 14 years, God appears to Abraham. And then he says, Walk before me faithfully and be blameless. Hallelujah. Amen. Now let me tell you this. There are certain things that you may be doing that is not God's perfect will, but God will allow it to go on for 14 years. Now maybe you're thinking in your mind, so God, why is it that when we gave birth to Ishmael, you did not appear suddenly at that time when Ishmael was born to tell me that I've made a mistake. God allowed it. You know, there is something that is called the permissive will of God. God will permit it. Yes, you committed the mistake, but God will permit it. Listen, I'm, I'm talking about your life purpose. I'm talking about your destiny. I'm talking about you veering off the main purpose for which God brought you here on this, uh, in, in this world. And certain things may go on for a while, but that does not mean God has allowed that, permitted that. Right? I once read um, Kenneth Higgins' book, one of his books, and when he finished Bible school, he started pastoring in a Baptist church. And he pastored for 12 years. And then at a point, he said, oh, let me just seek the face of God and ask God if, if I'm doing the right thing. Kenneth Hagin prayed and God told him, you are in the wrong business. He said, what's God? He said, yes. I never called you. Then he asked God, so why is it that you've been confirming your word with signs and wonders and miracles? The miracles were happening in the 12 years that he was pastoring. Healing was happening. People were getting healed. People were getting their miracles. People were getting, a uh, barren women were having their babies, so on and so forth. He said, so why your anointing, why your move? God said, I never told you to be a Baptist minister, pastor. But he allowed it for 12 years. Do you know what this tells us? What this tells us is that from point to point, you should be checking and rechecking with the Lord if you are doing what you are supposed to do. Do I say it again? From time to time, each of us should be rechecking and check to make sure that we are doing what we are supposed to do. You see, if by chance the Lord tells you, no, this is not what I'm telling you to do. I want you to move on. Be bold to leave whatever you are doing and move on. Amen. Oh, but pastor, the pastoral ministry is, is nice, it's good. Allow me to be a pastor. God told Abraham, Abraham asked about Ishmael, if you read on. Yeah? Abraham asks about Ishmael. What about Ishmael? God says, as for Ishmael, I'll bless him. But Isaac is the one that I have covenant with. Are you getting it? So if at a point God tells you 
leave this thing. I want you to do this. Leave it. And go and do what God wants you to do. Hallelujah. So God told Abraham, your wife, Sarah, verse 18, uh, verse 15, Genesis 17 and the verse 15. God also said to Abraham, as for Sarai, your wife, you are no longer to call her Sarai. Her name will be Sarah, our blesser, and will surely give you a son by her. Our blesser, so that she will be the mother of nations. Kings of, of peoples will come from her. Hallelujah. That is the word of the Lord. Just as God told Abraham to walk faithfully and blameless before him, let us also walk faithfully and be blameless before the Lord. Amen. Amen. We are walking with the Alpha and the Omega. He begins with us and he ends with us. Proverbs chapter 3 verse 5 will tell you that don't be wise in your own eyes. Don't be what? But in all your ways, acknowledge him. And he will make your path straight. Do we want a straight path? Amen. If we want a straight path, then we should learn to acknowledge the Lord in every way. And you can do that sort of acknowledgement by waiting on him from time to time. Hallelujah. You can acknowledge by waiting on him. Lord, do I take the next step? Lord, do I stop? Lord, do I turn left? Lord, do I turn right? Acknowledge him in all your ways. He may have permitted you to do certain things, but that thing is temporary. That thing is not your mission. Your mission is there waiting for you. Hallelujah. And you've got to pursue that mission. Amen. Now we're going to enter into a time of prayer.